Hi, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for doing this interview with me. I appreciate it. And Welcome. Um, just as a bit of background, tell us a bit about where you come from and how you got into uh, this profession. Sure. I grew up in a flower shop in Oakland, California, and I would sit at my mother's feet while she made these extravagant wild flower arrangements. And I would play with the plant trimmings and flower stems and give them names <laughs> and voices and bring them to life. So my origins were, you know, puppeting plants, <laughs> basically. And then when I was in middle school in the Bay Area, I had an art teacher who changed my life. Shout out to all of the teachers Absolutely, yeah. out there. Yeah, and her name is Audrey Brown, and we're still in touch. And she taught a segment on puppet making. And I was at that age in middle school where, you know, in sixth grade, where I was starting to think about what I wanted to do sure. when I grew up. And I knew I loved drawing and creating characters and drawing them and, and, and giving them personalities as a visual artist. Um, I also worked in the flower business, so I became involved in design and style. Um, we had a very, uh, a very style oriented uh, shop and my mom was sort of a pioneer when it came to uh, uh, setting the tone visually and helping educate people. She brought a lot of European influence actually into the flower shop. So the, yeah, style and the visual world was really fun and compelling to me and I loved making things. And I was a total ham. I was singing and voicing characters and uh, I was in the school productions and plays. I was Hugo in Bye Bye Birdie in middle school. But it's funny, like I, I played that role in that production in sixth grade, you know, but I also designed the backdrop for the set. It's like, okay, which were these enormous faces of like teeny bopper girls. <laughs> That, that I just drew on huge construction paper. They lined the back of the stadium uh, of the gym on the stage with construction paper. And I drew these huge freehand faces, cartoon faces. And then um, there's- As a civilian, uh, what, uh, who the big players are in the world of, uh, of puppetry? Because sure. the, uh, what I'm familiar with is um, what I've been exposed to. But a lot of times when you're watching something, you don't realize you're actually watching a puppet because the character is so animated, you get lost in that fantasy world. And, uh, you know, as a, as a young kid, we all think of the Muppets, the Muppet show and, and that venue. But who are some of the big players that, uh, that are in the industry that, uh, that you can name off? Sure. So, you know, you've definitely got the folks who perform the Muppets. Um, the Muppets are now owned by Disney, and the Jim Henson Company is another major player. So you've got the Disney puppet Muppet wing branch, and then you've got the Jim Henson Company. And the Jim Henson Company um, has something called the, Pup, the Jim Henson Alternative. Okay. And that is a, they're, they're producing all sorts of different content, a lot of more adult oriented things. There's a show called Earth to Ned that is shooting another season right now. Um, and the Jim Henson Company has been very uh, involved in bringing more diversity to its, uh, to its puppeteers and puppeteer base. And I have the privilege of working with uh, a puppeteer named Colleen Smith, who's one of the uh, Henson's key puppeteers. Uh, she and I are shooting a show called Let's Be Real for Fox right now. Uh, Let's Be Real is a political puppet show, much like uh, the two that you mentioned, the one from the UK, and I, though I, uh, yeah, in the UK say, they have they had that uh, series called um, Spitting Image. That's right, which was, was just yes. hilarious. But here yes. in France, um, Gignos de l'Info, yeah, Gignos de l'Info, which is Gignos a huge success. De la, de, Gignos de l'Info, almost, almost. Do it again. <laughs> Gignos, the Gignos. Gignos. Gino de l'Info. Gino de l'Info. Yeah, and that one was a huge success here in France with, um, because it parodied 
it, it picked up certain traits and characteristics of um, political figures and media figures and, and you know, television personalities. And it just skewered them, not in a malicious way necessarily, but just kind of like brought them down a couple of levels so that the, the, the puppet and the, and the person kind of uh, almost melded into one identity in, a lot of, in the minds of a lot of people. So yeah, the, those, those two uh, shows were such huge, such huge successes, both in the UK and, and here in France. Why, why do you think that something like that, although you did mention you're doing something that now with the Fox uh, uh, production, but um, is there an opportunity you think in the US for more of that type of satire slash comedy slash um, creative outlet for, for people involved in, in your industry? Absolutely. If you go back a few years to the popularity of Triumph the Insult Dog. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so the man who created that character and performed, sorry, one moment, please. The man who, the man who created uh, and performed Triumph is a comedian and, and comic writer, Robert Smigel. Yes. And he is the creator of Let's Be Real, the show that I'm shooting now for Fox Network. Oh, great. Okay. It is everything that you're describing uh, and more. It is wild. It has been a wild adventure shooting this show. Oh, great. Um, I, I have had, and it, it, there's, uh, you can watch the first episode, which aired during the election, which is streaming now on Hulu. You'll see my work, Puppeteering Trump, doing an actual Zoom interview with Stormy Daniels. <laughs> so he, uh, a, a Zoom conversation with Stormy Daniels. Um, I performed Biden for a scene with, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, the king of late night, Larry King. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, it was really cool to shoot with him oh, and, and I'm an honor. Uh, it's, a, it's a really fun project and you know, there's so much going on in politics and in, in the injustice, the racial inequity in our country, the economic issues that we're dealing with, um, the insanity around what goes down in Washington, the, the value of laughter to really bring these issues up and look at how ridiculous reality is, is something that puppets can do. And I'm so delighted to be bringing these characters to life and helping that conversation get tackled. So it's, it's a completely scripted show, I imagine, the, uh, this new one on, uh, it is. Know, what you called it? On, on, Let's Be Real. Let's Be Real. Yeah, the, the, uh, Triumph, the, the Triumph the Insult uh, comic dog uh, was such a huge phenomenon, both with, um, I think he started, what, on, on Conan O'Brien, maybe? But uh, yes. Yeah, Smigel and, and his Smigel writer. Uh, the creators of the Conan show. Yeah, and uh, what, uh, David Feldman, I think, was one of the writers for uh, for Cohen, uh, for the um, for Triumph. So yeah, if you have really great writing that uh, is complemented with uh, some amazing uh, puppetry, I mean, as RuPaul says, we all love puppets, right? So everybody loves puppets. Everybody loves puppets. So great. And that's what we've got here. The writing in this show is so good, and it's it's so funny. You know, you're you're shooting the scene and. Then they say cut and everybody breaks into laughter. <laughs> it's the best. I wanted to list a few other of my friends who are really forerunners in the puppetry game out here. Uh, Michelle Zamora of Viva La Puppet. Uh, she is a good friend of mine. We met doing a puppetry workshop together for an educational theater company about 10 years ago. And she and I have partnered on a lot of projects. She's uh, her company has done a lot of puppet, pup built and performed puppets for a lot of TV commercials. Um, and she has hired me and brought me into a multiple events, uh, projects. So Michelle Zamora, uh, brilliant. Uh, then you've got Russ Waco. She plays Waffles, by the way, in oh. Waffles and Mochi. And then Russ Waco plays Mochi in Waffles and Mochi. He was also the puppet captain of our show. I've worked with Russ for years as well. Um, he's one of those... Uh, you know, he has a very introverted personality. And then when he has a puppet on his hand, this comes comic alive. gold comes out, he comes alive, this comic gold comes out of his mind, your mouth, you're like, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, I've, I've got some really, uh, some really great friends in, in the puppetry world. Uh, I've got a, a builder that I've worked with uh, over the years. His name is Greg Ballora. 
Uh, he's a, a phenomenal puppet builder. A lot of puppeteers know Greg. Um, uh, Jurgen Michelson is a puppet builder who's helped me with uh, creatures that I've designed and built, and he builds for the Muppets. Russ also builds for the Muppets. Of course, I mentioned Sean and Patrick Johnson. Um, Andy Hayward is the puppet wrangler for mm -hmm. Waffles and Mochi. He is another queer puppeteer. Uh, there are a lot of us out there, queer puppeteers. Uh, so I'm happy to represent for my pride posse. Uh, I think puppetry is a form of drag. Uh, and Absolutely. It, for years has been a form of drag. So a lot of really incredible people uh, in my world. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, how puppets can kind of break down gay barriers and stereotypes. Sure. Because um, since puppets are on the one hand, and pardon the pun, uh, a bit of uh, entertainment, but on the other hand, educative. Um, is there something that we as adults can learn from, uh, say, a gay puppet? So, uh, is there is there some way that uh, I remember as a kid watching um, what was the TV show uh, like Solid Gold or Hollywood Squares yeah. with uh, yes. with Waylon Flowers and Adam? Oh my God! <laughs> we went to Disneyland the other day. We did it all. We went up on the Matterhorn and down on the Mad Hatter. Well, there we were at the spinning teacup ride, and I had no place to sit. So. I had to sit on Pinocchio's face. He started telling me the strangest story. I said, Pinocchio, you know, those stories aren't true, but lie, you little devil lie. <laughs> I actually Absolutely. performed, um, I performed Madam uh, for uh, a few different events. Uh, and I, it was such a pleasure to get to, to do that character. And uh, I love Waylon Flowers. He was in a very powerful, had a powerful impact on me. And I think what, what's, so what's so important for children is to have their reality affirmed. Absolutely. We all live in our, in our own reality. We see the world through our eyes and no one else's. Yep. And children see the world through their eyes and they're processing who they are uh, in their own way. And we need to give them the uh, affirmation that lets them just be confident in their development. So seeing a character that has something that connects with you, that gives you a sense of affirmation, that gives you that spark of joy, that, that makes you laugh because you can see something about your experience living out in that character's experience is very powerful. I think what was so powerful for you with watching Madam as a kid might be similar to what was powerful for me is I saw you know, that there was a male actor voicing a female character with such a feminine energy. And what I noticed about myself and my reality as a little boy is that I had a very feminine energy and it wasn't welcome. I was made fun of for being, for acting like a girl. I threw like a girl. I stood like a girl. I talked like a girl. I played with girls toys. And it was something I learned to hide and to uh, sequester. I think part of the reason puppetry actually drew, spoke to me was because part of the job is hiding. And the, the homophobia is not about uh, a fear of gay men or women. It's about a suppression of femininity and womanhood. The healing and, uh, and the healing of homophobia is really a coming to terms with the power of the feminine dynamic. Healing homophobia is about accepting female energy and letting female energy be as powerful as it is. And our human civilization, our human race, doesn't have a very good track record with accepting female energy. Right. And when you look, when I look at, you know, what it is that people have a problem with. It's a problem with letting female energy 
do what it wants to do and be how it wants to be and show up where it wants to show up that a woman shouldn't you know a woman who really would be expected to own that female energy acts too masculine well that's seen as an empowerment of the female energy and that's that's not allowed in conservative culture a male exemplifying female energy well that's the female energy being empowered in a way with that masculine energy and then that's suppressed so homophobia is about suppressing the female energy and when you as a young gay man see a female character that connects with your own female energy that's empowering that's having your reality affirmed and my reality was so affirmed because there's a strength to masculine and feminine energy together unified and a man doing a female voice or a female wearing a male style there's a powerful energy to it and i hope that as our society, especially here in the United States, but really worldwide, uh, that we move more away from the duality thinking of male and female to the unity thinking of we are human beings and we all embody male and female characters and our society will get stronger the more welcoming we are to the blended energy that we naturally have. Mm -hmm. Great, great way to end the interview. Very positive. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for your time. You're absolutely welcome, Buck. It was a total pleasure and uh, have a beautiful rest of your evening. Thank you. You too. Bye.